Welcome to Mind Pump. This is the world's top fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. Um, in this episode, we answer fitness and health questions asked by listeners like you. But we open the episode with introductory conversation where we talk about scientific studies, sometimes random conversation, and other times we mention our sponsors. So here's the breakdown of what happened in today's Mind Pump podcast episode. Here's the breakdown. I open up the episode by talking about random fish news, science alert. <laughs> then we talk about how- We need a button for that. Obesity may be one of the, the, the worst things you can have if you get infected with the coronavirus. They're showing that that is uh, one of the worst comorbidities. Um, then we're talking about how hospitals are laying people off. That's right, uh, with all of this stuff that's going that's on. That's interesting. They're not getting enough work. That's kind of crazy. Then we talked about the gym industry. We recently did an episode where we interviewed uh, industry leaders and asked them their opinion on the future of the gym industry. So we kind of went in on that topic. Um, then Justin brought up his interesting thoughts on gangs yeah. and social distancing. Uh, then Is he not really a gang anymore? Then he talked about the toilet paper king. Uh, Roll Exotic, is that right. the thing? Yeah, Roll Exotic, that's what we're calling them now. That's pretty good. Uh, Adam mentioned how Felix Gray, they're the company that makes the best looking blue light blocking glasses you'll find anywhere. It's their birthday. Uh, what does that mean for you? 15% off any products on their entire site. So Felix Gray is known for having some of the best blue light blocking glasses. They look amazing and they never go on sale. So this is huge. Take advantage. Here's how you get the 15% off birthday sale from Felix Gray glasses. Just go to Felix Gray glasses. That's F-E-L-I-X-G-R-A-Y glasses.com forward slash mind pump. Go there, you get free shipping, free returns, and of course, 15% off to celebrate their birthday. Then I talked about how I'm eating tons of Paleo Valley grass-fed meat sticks. Mm. Now, I'm eating them right now because I'm at home. Just and garbling them up. I'm trying to avoid eating all the processed food. Well, meat sticks, uh, you know, they're, they're convenient. They have a long shelf life. They're grass-fed, naturally fermented, uh, low in calories, high in protein. It's a great snack for the house right now. Uh, by the way, if you go to paleovalley.com forward slash mind pump, that's P-A-L-E-O valley.com forward slash mind pump and use the code mind pump 15. That's the number 15 in the word mind pump. You get 15% off your first order. And then we got into politics a little bit and I talked about the Democrats political potential political strategy that I think could be a game changer. Ooh, interesting. And then we got into the fitness questions. The first question, this person is has unbalanced muscular development. So one arm is bigger than the other, and they want to know what the best strategy is to balance those out. The next question, this person does lots of squats and deadlifts, with de which definitely work the core. The core has to stabilize the body. So they want to know, should they even work their abs directly? Is that something that's even going to benefit them? The next question, this person says, look, the front squat is now often being regarded as more functional than the back squat. Does that mean I can just do front squats? Should I avoid back squats now since I already deadlift? So that gets my glutes and hamstrings and I'm front squatting. So what's the deal? Mm. And the final question, this person wants to know what the hardest obstacles each of us have ever had to overcome in regards to fitness. So Justin uh, tells his story, Adam tells his story, and then I tell my story. Um, also, this month, Maps Prime and Prime Pro are both 50% off. By the way, as of the airing of this episode, you have 48 hours left to take advantage of this promotion. <laughs> After two days, these programs will double in price, okay? Now, Maps Prime is a phenomenal program to teach you how to set up your priming session based off of the way your body moves. There's an assessment tool in there. You take the test, figure out what your imbalances are, Design your own pre-workout priming session. Now you can do 10 minutes of targeted priming before your workout to give you better movement, greater ranges of motion, more strength, reductions in injury, and just better results overall. Now Prime Pro is all about correctional exercise. So this program, you go in there, you identify the joints you want to work on, areas you feel like your mobility can improve, areas that may have bothered you in the past with pain, and you target them with the Prime Pro exercises and exercise demo videos. Okay, so both are half off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and use the code PRIME50 for the discount. That's P-R-I-M-E-5-0, no space. Again, you only have two days left of this month to take advantage of this promotion. 
And it's t-shirt time. Oh, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Oh, yeah. Mm, you didn't just see that woke co- him up. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we have three winners this week. One for iTunes, two for Facebook. The iTunes winner is Aristotle Daphnis Fitness. For Facebook, we have Keisha Watts and Mary Jorgensen. All three of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Hey, I got a, I got a joke, an old joke, old school joke. Let's hear it. Let's oh, hear my, it. my so favorite. Is it a podcast program? Is it a knock knock? No, there's this, there's this uh, this this old couple hanging out, and uh, you know, someone asked the old man, "Hey, man, this this wine you're serving us is just incredible. What's the name of the wine? What was it?" And he goes, "Oh, he goes, damn, I forgot." And he goes, "Hey, um, he goes, what's that?" Um, that flower that grows with the red, you know, petals, and you give it to someone you fall in love with, and like, oh, Rose. He goes, that's right. Hey, Rose, what was the name of that wine we got? When- <laughs> 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 oh, yeah. yeah. Hey, I got some random Boom. science fish news for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fishy, right? Cause if, yeah. Anyway. J- I, jokes. <laughs> thanks, right? thanks, Justin. Yeah, I had to. I, I was uh, sitting at home, and um, I was just... You know, I, I haven't done this in a long time. I used to love doing this where I would just get into rabbit holes and just learn random shit, you know? Yeah, I, I've been doing that a lot. This is very fascinating. I did not know this. So you guys know great white sharks, right? Okay, I've heard of them. Now, great white sharks, in my mind, are like, they're like the, the lions of the ocean. Like Jaws. Ain't, ain't yeah. nobody fucking with them. They're the apex predators. They're a freaking great Have white shark. Have you seen them attack seals and like bust through the top of the water oh, and like dude. launch? Oh, they're like... Torpedoes. They're like missiles. Yeah, oh, it's scary. Like torpedoes. They're yeah. frightening. Frightening. Here's something very interesting. Mm. If great white sharks go to a hunting ground, let's say there's a bunch of seals and they sh- and they're hunting the seals, and it's like amazing. There's so many seals and they're eating them. If orcas pass through that area, the great whites run away. They yeah. they they, they, they yeah, don't run. They swim. Bitches. <laughs> they swim away, and they don't come back for months, sometimes years. Wow. Because they're terrified. The ultimate flex. Oh, yeah. They're terrified of uh, killer whales. Yeah. And then in 1997, this is the first time it was ever- killer in their name. <laughs> they you know? do. Yeah, recognized. Yeah. yeah. They got good PR. Yeah. Don't they? they <laughs> you know certainly do. What kind of name should we have? <laughs> they, in 1997, this is the first time this was ever filmed, they filmed orcas uh, attacking and killing uh, killer whites, actually hunting them. And before that, they kind of speculated that this happened, but never saw it. Yeah. Here's what's even weirder. So you know what they do when they get to the, the great white? Mm. They they attack them. They bite open their gut. Then they crush them and squeeze the liver out. Eat the liver and leave the, the carcass and swim away. Dude. So when when they, gangster. Yeah. So when they find empty like liverless great white uh, car- carcasses, they mm-hmm. know that it was like killed. We've by, been here. It was a killer whale that did that. Yeah. Wow. Tell me that's not crazy. That is oh, kind of yeah. crazy. Killer whales are like, they look like they're, you know. What sends you down smart. that rabbit hole? I have no idea. Were you watching? <laughs> I think that's like five <laughs> levels of rabbit holes. Yeah, see, because I knew that occasionally they'd run into them and, and they would, you know, some of them would kill them, but I didn't know that they actively like hunted them. They actively hunt them. And then yeah. because orcas are, you know, from the dolphin family, they work together. So sh- great white sharks are kind of loners, right? They don't really work together. Sometimes they kill, fight each other for food. Orcas swim and will trap food or push things up to shore so they can attack them. Yeah, sharks are fucked. I didn't know that. I thought sharks worked together too. No, is that not, true? No, not like an or- not oh, like some they're... sharks might, but not not the great ones. Mm, not yeah. the- <laughs> when you're when you're great, you're by yourself. Yeah, not the great whites. Yeah, isn't that crazy? That is crazy. We're all we think they're so cute and friendly. No, <laughs> it's not the case. Deadly, yeah. deadly, <laughs> deadly killers. Anyway, how's you guys' weekend? It was good. Oh, you know, it's funny. Uh, so this new norm thing, right, with not being able to go places you used to go, like my parents decided they would watch the kids for me. I'm like, oh, sweet. This is great. You know, the, the one family we've been interacting with, you know, I'm sure I'll get flack for that, but whatever. My 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 kids go to stay there overnight. We get a date for once. So where do we go? We have no idea what we're going to do. So we go get like uh, some tacos and then we take it out to like Westcliff where there's a place where you could like watch the sunset and all this kind of stuff. You can't park anywhere. Everything's closed. You know, there's nowhere to go. So we found this spot that was like, I could pull off like the road that was just next to the, to the ocean. And we kind of were in somebody's driveway. <laughs> 
And we just parked it there, you know, turned it down. We're listening to music. We're eating. I, I snuck some white claws. We're sitting there like drinking, <laughs> and allegedly, you know, <laughs> drinking, like looking out for cops and stuff. I felt like I was a fucking in junior high. <laughs> yeah, but it was awesome. Dude, we had a great time. That's hilarious. Yeah. And the windows all fogged up. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> if people were driving by, we ducked down, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Dude, have you, did you ever get caught like that when you were a kid in the car? Uh, yeah, I think it was, uh, somebody was hot boxing, you know? Oh, dude, I and was, it was it, obvious. I was in the car with my girlfriend at the time and that's what you used to do when you were a kid. You had nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. You're not going to go to a hotel room. You both live with your parents. So it's like, where are you going to go to get some privacy? So we used to, we had this, there was a specific parking lot that we used to go and park in and, you know, we would do, you know, whatever, hang out. And, uh, you know, the windows would get all fogged up. Well, this is a true story. We're in the car and we're fooling around or whatever, and I hear tap 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 on the window, mm-hmm. and I look up and it, no joke, it's a cop with a with a flashlight through the window. Wow! And um, we were in various degrees of undress in yeah. the car. Super. That's happened to me too. Frightening. Yeah. I'm and embarrassing. I, hopefully the cop just lets you guys go though, right? I mean that's like no. A, here's the pad he part. Made me like like walk and, and do the whole thing. Like he was messing what? with me. Oh, what? they did for you? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Like it was like, I was like drinking. I wasn't even drinking. We were just necking. You know what I mean? Wow. <laughs> he did that to you? Yeah. You're hella white too. That's weird. I know. You just dated yourself right That's there it. too. <laughs> <laughs> That's what says it. We Nobody were, goes out next we anymore. Were, we you imagine, if Justin, yeah. imagine if Justin was ethnic? Yeah. <laughs> they would have beat their shit. <laughs> That's terrible. Yeah, they would have. No, dude. What was weird with me is the cop, not only he flashed our light through, but, you know, we were, like I said, we were in various, you know, degrees of undress. Fucker stood there and watched us. Wow. You know. That's get, a power move. <laughs> no, it's a creepy move, <laughs> dude. Like, what are you doing, bro? Just looking in. and My girlfriend's trying to get her clothes on, bro. <laughs> I mean, at that age, though, you're probably just happy you didn't get in trouble. Like, whatever. No, it's true. He did. Yeah. He's like, I should probably tell your parents. I'm like, please don't do that, dude. Yeah. That would be the most embarrassing thing <laughs> in the world. Yeah, it was good times. If you told my parents. Dude, you know what they found in... Um, in uh, New York City, the the number one, uh, I guess, comorbidity, the the number one reason that people would have fatal, um, you know, would die from the coronavirus, what it was? Diabetes. Obesity. obesity. And obesity-related yeah. diseases. I saw that. Uh. So being overweight in, in that case. Yeah. Apparent, and they're finding, they're mirroring that in other, in other studies. It's so interesting. It's like... And then, you, and then you look at like where the culture was like leading into this whole like crisis and everything of how we were just trying to like justify, you know, obesity and like the new, like it, like it's normal, like, mm. you know, it's healthy. It's like the, the, the spin that we were trying to place on it when in fact it's not, you know, advantageous for you to, to stave off like diseases. No, no. It's again, it was the number one, um, you know, I guess common reason why a lot of people didn't make it. It was obesity and obesity related diseases like high blood pressure, diabetes. Um, so stay in shape, man. Stay fit and that's right, keep man. Keep yourself healthy. Yeah, that's what, important. What's your guys' thoughts on how this plays out then? We just recently did an episode <clears throat> where we interviewed, you know, five different uh, fitness leaders in their space and we talked about the the potentials of it crippling a lot of businesses. Now do you see, and I don't, we didn't cover this, but you know, I have something that I, I think as a theory will happen potentially is if we go back to normal and no businesses are affected that bad and everybody pretty much is okay. Do you see that as a possibility is happening? Like for example, if more and more data keeps coming out and before we, and, and when it's all said and done, we find out that the you know, the death rate is extremely lower than what we saw. In fact, it's, you know, no more dangerous than the flu. Other than we know we know that it spreads faster, right? That's already mm-hmm. been proven. It's been proven that it, it's it's more infectious and we don't have a vaccine. So therefore it does make it scary for those reasons and the and how overwhelming it can be for hospitals. But if these tests start coming back like they are right now, and more and more people potentially already had it or asymptomatic, do you think this potentially could be enough for people to go like, oh, this this is no scarier than. than- well, I just have I've been talking uh, with with Courtney and like some of her friends are actually are still working in the hospitals and in the environment, and they're they're reporting back that they, I mean, they're getting sent home. They they don't have enough 
uh, you know, Work. patients yeah. coming in for them to even service. And yep. so it's like, it's, it's total misinformation that's getting flooded out there. Like, oh, we're just going to, you know, crowd the, the hospitals. Like there's, there's hospitals that are sl- like struggling to just make it, you know, business wise. That's right actually now. true. They're, some of the biggest layoffs are happening in hospitals right now, because what you have is you have a, a you know, laws ordering non-emergency surgeries to be shut down. You have people who are not going to the doctor. In fact, right. you know, strokes Why and heart you attacks. Why would go in right now? Strokes and heart attacks are down. You guys know that? Which wow. is weird. But people aren't going to the hospital. They're not going to their doctor. And so they are laying people off like crazy. Here's how I. Here's my opinion on what, what I think is going to happen with the gyms and wh- what you said, Adam. The, there's two main factors that can affect businesses. One is consumer confidence, uh, consumer fear. That's going to play a role. Consumer fear is hard to predict. People are really easily scared. Very, very difficult to unscare them. Once we're frightened, it's hard because now the game can be this. Like, oh, not as many people died. And then people can come back and say, well, that's because we shut everything down. That's because we weren't going anywhere. So you can kind of get in that that spin. Mm-hmm. So there's that. But that's up to the consumer. We'll see what how we all feel and if we're scared or not scared or whatever. Here's the one that I think the the factor that I think has the biggest impact legislation legislation yeah because the 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 legislators are going to be passing um, laws that require businesses to maintain uh, distance between consumers that are going to maybe maybe they'll pass laws that say you have to take people's temperatures you can only allow this many people per square foot in your facility and many gyms are based on a model of getting X amount of people per square foot. Well, if, if legislation comes out and they say, um, you know, you have to cut that in half, well, that's going to kill that business. The whole model was designed around, you know, something completely different. So the legislation is where I see the problems. Mm. Now, how long could legislation last? I don't know, three months, six months, you yeah. know, until a vaccine is out, which would be even longer. But let's just say three months. Let's say for the next three months, you got to make a third of your income you, after being shut down for two months. You, mm-hmm. How many fitness right. companies do you know that could survive that? No, I oh, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think it's that's tough. What, I think that's what we're. It's going to be. That part's going to be scary. Imagine how frustrating on for a small box owner that like like a CrossFit or an Orange Theory. How frustrating that is if even if the stats come out and people are like, oh, I'm no longer afraid anymore. But it doesn't matter because they've already said, listen. Until we get the vaccine, or until we know for sure, we're the, these are the precautions, and that's why I was. That's why I liked that we did that episode because of all the different industries that are going to be impacted. Once the fear goes away, I can't see anybody being more impacted than gyms. Do you? Yeah, yeah gyms. Like I was at. Like I would have thought restaurants would be up there too, right? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. I disagree with that now. Like. I was, we were up in, uh, we're staying up at the uh, sanctuary where I love to go up by the beach right now, right? And uh, we ordered uh, curbside mm-hmm. at, at the, the fish, Fisherman's Grotto, my favorite place up at Fisherman's Wharf up there. And uh, the kid runs up and, and he's got a mask on and everything and, he, and he, he's got gloves and delivers it into my, uh, into the passenger side of my car and everything. And I asked him, I said, hey, so how's business? How are you guys doing? He goes, you know, uh, we're we're doing okay actually. A lot of people are, and they, by the way, they were they are offering people that did curbside twenty five percent off of their bill. So mm-hmm. it's even a, it's even a better deal for us to to get food from them. And I and he goes, I guess uh, city officials over there are already talking about what it's going to look like in uh, their in least in their county. The restaurants are looking to open up next month, but it'll be you're allowed half the tables. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So half the tables be able to serve. And he says that they 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 have now made this model work so well that it'll probably be a, a model they keep forever hmm. where you just do curbside like that and come pick the food up, which they weren't doing before. So I think a lot of restaurants that have pivoted really quick have found that they're having a lot of success with this and they might be okay. Yeah, I I've think- noticed the same thing. Uh, I was talking to one of my favorite restaurants about that and they converted to Grubhub and like all these like like food service deliveries that they had like a specific uh, part of the back door open for them. And so they were like in and out like all day long, just getting food and driving out. And then in the front, you could come in and, you know, pick up and, and do curbside it, with that too. But it's still a pivot. I but think it's, 
Yeah, but I mean, they've been yeah. able to like lessen the blow versus like a gym has not been able to just slightly, you know, add rev. Like the whole virtual model for like a, a commercial yeah. gym is. I mean, come on. No, no. There's no doubt that the service industry, travel industry, and the and the fitness industry, the gym industry will be hardest. But I think the gym industry will be among the hardest hit of all of those. Um, again, because their models are so dependent on something that will probably be made impossible to do. Um, with legislation. And I'll tell you what, look, mm. I grew up in gyms, okay? I, I, I became a member of a gym at the age of 15. Never, I have not, not stepped foot in a gym for longer than a few weeks uh, since, since the age of 15. So I've been there for decades, uh, you know, working in them professionally, managing locations. I have never seen yeah. some of the current trends that I'm seeing. Here's, some, here's what, an example. I'm getting, no joke, at least 10, if not more, DMs a day of people who have made their own home gym equipment. Yeah. Made it. Yeah. Either they made it with iron or wood. Mm -hmm. or And why are they doing this? Because at-home gym equipment is so high in demand right now, you can't find any. And so people are building. I have did two polls on my stories. And my stories get a decent amount of views. They get So it doesn't represent everybody, but you know I'm getting sixteen to 20,000 views on those things. And I did two polls. One of them was... Would you be willing to pay double or triple your monthly dues to continue going to the gym? Because twenty yeah. percent. That's eighty yeah. percent said no. Yeah. And 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 by the way, uh -huh. my audience is skews hardcore. Yeah. People who follow me are really into yeah, fitness. Yeah, exactly. They, they're real gym goers. Yeah, and eighty percent of them said no. And you know what the comments were? It's not worth it. I'm just going to work out at home. I'm going to buy gym equipment and stay I, home. I agree. I found right. that interesting too because I I posted the the little teaser of the episode we did. You know, and I got a couple people on there. Oh, I I don't care what you guys say. As soon as the gym day up, one. Yeah, day yeah. one. I'm back there. I'm like, well, okay, well, that's great. But it, it's not about you. Yeah, or, and or are you willing to pay twice or three times as much? Yeah, but even then, again, what, what depends on what your your gym is forced to do. Like that's great. You are one of the you know thousands, let's say, that agree. Like, hey, day one, I'm back in there. I'm not afraid of what's going on, so I'm going to go in there. It doesn't even matter what you think mm -hmm. if they don't allow you. If they don't allow enough people, it's just a numbers game. It's You're like, right, listen, yeah. if right. you if you take two thirds of anybody's fitness business, I don't know. Fitness, we've already talked about this. Fitness is not a it's not like finances there's not huge margins mm -mm, you own no. a gym even a well-oiled machine is not cranking out huge revenue numbers mm -mm. and if they are you're an anomaly right for the most part majority of people that are running these businesses it's a it's a passion it's business. costly too you love yeah. to do it because you love having a gym and hey you found a way to make decent money doing it if you told most of those people that you you now don't have the ability to make two-thirds the income Boy, that's going to be crippling for a lot more people than you think. A lot yeah. of gyms are heavily leveraged. Very few gyms own their equipment outright. Most of them lease a lot of the equipment, which makes sense because you have a lot of people using it. And when you lease equipment, you can switch it out, keep mm -hmm. things new. So they've got high bills, big footprints. So there's a high rent. You have a staff that you have to pay. Um, it's just And here's the thing. If gyms close down... It will be more because of the legislators and regulations, and less because of consumer uh, because of consumers. I'm gonna tell you that straight up right now. It's the legislation and the laws and the regulations that will cripple oh, the yeah. gym industry. It's not going to be the consumers. The consumers can decide for themselves how they want to show up, how they want to work out. I'm and already annoyed with this whole mask thing, man. Like it's yeah. it, it's everywhere now, right? You have to get it into just like a convenience store. You have to wear it. So I I borrowed my dad's uh, a handkerchief. So I have to so you look like a gangbanger. Yeah, and it's red, dude. <laughs> so I'm like going into the store and I was like, "Ah, the bandito is here." You know, like I I, just, I thought that was so crazy to me that that makes you feel more comfortable. Like I, I totally felt like a bank robber going in there. And then I, it got me to think, I'm like, wait a minute. Like, what about actual gangbangers? You know, are they like practicing social distance? Like, what does that even look like? Is it really a gang at that point? Or is it just a plethora of people? Of yeah, members? Yeah. Stay, stay, yeah. We are a plethora. Yeah. Stay at home. Okay. Yeah. No, it's, um, uh, it, it is kind of, look, I was also thinking about, um, you know, liability waivers. Like when you walk into a gym and you sign a liability waiver, are they going to put on there? Increased risk of COVID yeah. for coming in. Oh, Our yeah. liability waiver is going to change. Oh, uh, I'm sure. It's and again, it's it's about the environment. Here's why I think the restaurant industry, um, I uh, also going to suffer heavily. Now I'm sure they can pivot, like you said, Adam, but I think they're going to suffer because just like the gym, you go to a restaurant and a big part and restaurant owners know this. What makes a restaurant successful? What do they call it? The ambiance, right? It's the experience. Yeah. What if you go in there? 
waiters have masks on, disposable menus. You're sitting far away from everybody. You've got this kind of weird, like, yeah. uh, I don't know. I'm on the fence on that one because yeah. I also think that we are in the middle right now of an explosion of a, an in totally new market that didn't exist a decade ago. And that is the DoorDashes, the Grubhubs, the Uber sure. Eats. Like, that didn't exist a decade ago. And that is exploding, but it's still, and it hasn't hit the peak yet because I still have lots of family and friends that don't use those services because they've never done it before and they don't realize how convenient and nice it is. Now, I love it, mm -hmm. but it, I, even even me, I was, I remember I was eating at restaurants, I used to eat at this breakfast spot every single morning, right? And I remember when DoorDash first came on the scene before I even knew what it was and I'd see, I'd be sitting there and then all of a sudden out of nowhere, I've been eating here for years, right? Same spot, everything. All of a sudden, I start seeing the, you know these kids coming in wearing this red shirt all the time, and they're picking. I remember asking the owners there, like, "Oh yeah, that's a, that's a DoorDash. It's a new service." Where they and they explained it to me. I'm like, "Oh, that's brilliant," and I, it must have been probably a year or so that was there before I even decided. Let me try this and see how it is. Now I live on it. I love it and use it all the time. I think there's actually a ton of people that have been introduced to that that have never been introduced mm -hmm. to that before. And if businesses have now pivoted to being able to offer that service, it may be enough to supplement them to continue to be okay and survive. And then the future may look like for them to downsize their restaurant. Maybe now we don't have a restaurant that's massive and, and this They just future, have a kitchen. Right. They have mostly a, a kitchen mm -hmm. and they cater more It's almost to like a drive through just for the door, uh, the DoorDash people, and then you can come in the front. Right. So it, Totally. I, it's going to be a kitchen. I find what Jason Kalipa said the most interesting like when we uh, he, some of the points he made i thought were really really good and one of the ones that you know we, like there's a lot of gyms right now that uh, out of desperation and, and and necessity have pivoted to virtual like we've got to figure something out whether and and they all seem to do that some of them offered it as a free service just to stay in touch with their members some of them have completely pivoted into a paid service that way and when he made the point about being very careful of losing your identity and going all, you know, or, or having one foot in the brick and mortar and one foot in the virtual, that is a really good point. And it's one that we, we can speak to and have uh, intimate knowledge of. Uh, all three of us have ran and been in brick and mortar for more than a decade. And now we've got over five years of experience of, of complete virtual business. Yeah. And one thing I think we can all agree on is, they are total different monsters. Totally Completely. different animals. Yes. And so you may be finding that you're okay and you're surviving by pivoting to virtual right now because it's kind of a weird time. And so it's kind of getting by. But if you think you're now going to become this virtual business and that's a mainstream, there's other things you need to be thinking about that like b building a serious online presence mm -hmm. that maybe you don't really have. And that we know how long that takes. It takes yeah. a long time to do that. Yeah. I think, I don't think the demand again, and here's something that may, that the fitness industry may use uh, to their advantage. I just talked about how obesity was the number one risk factor for, you know, severe complications from COVID. Well, that may be something that the fitness industry and the gym industry uses to lobby to you know to lawmakers and to also use as a as a selling point like hey yeah. one thing that we've noticed is that people who are fit and get sick are far less likely to have severe complications and die and you know and have all this. so that may be one way to do it but here's what I think I don't think people will stop working out I want to be very clear I just think that their behaviors are going to change I think yeah. people are going to probably want to work out more at home more stuff outdoors. The people who are really hardcore fitness fanatics uh, may either really well equip their home gyms or maybe the ones willing to pay the high dollar amount to go work out at a gym. But those gyms' business models did not, they weren't built on those kind of people. They were built on. I definitely see those streaming services in the forefront, like really taking off, like uh, these classes and, uh, you know, Peloton was a good one, but like also, like, I mean, there's a few different examples of that, but, you know, that sort of live feel where you can connect and have community with people still somehow, but like through virtual means. Yeah. But, uh, again, it's 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 never going to really replace the same thing. So it may be just a bubble, a bubble where people aren't comfortable yet. You know, we're going to go in this direction for a while, and then maybe the dust settles well, and comes back. You have to factor in too how many people. So we said what six hundred and seventy six percent increase in gym equipment at home gym equipment. There's going to be a good majority of people that just invested a thousand dollars on a squat rack and whatever a whole setup. And just that in itself is yeah. enough to keep you from going Dude. back. Maybe I want to go back, or maybe I may even think about it at one point. But right now, it's like I just spent. But you're all this invested now. Yeah. yeah. You, you want to hear my uh, a little some alarming comments I was getting? 
These are from hardcore gym enthusiasts who you would think would be like, no, man, I'm going to pay. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to support them no matter what. I got messages from them. They're like, well, I'm going to wait till these gyms liquidate and I'm going to buy their equipment. Yeah. That's the, I got a lot of those messages. Yeah. So, you know, people will still, and here's the thing. If you own it, be a lot of that. If you own a gym and this is something that I, I learned owning a personal training studio versus managing big box gyms. You the the more service you provide, the more close contact you have with individual members, the more you know their name, they know your name, the more loyal they're going to be. Mm -hmm. The big box gym model is hard to do. That. It's very hard to do that. Now I tried to do. That. I was on the workout floor all the time as a general manager, trying to know people. We had so many people that I, it's impossible for me to be like that with everyone. And many managers in these big box gyms are encouraged not to do that. Mm -hmm. They're encouraged to stay in their office, look at the paperwork, and you know, sales staffs are being dwindled. I mean, the fitness, the big box gym industry, we know this, went from trying to be more service to trying to be as cheap as possible, and that happened over the course of a couple decades. That means you have zero loyalty. You have no loyalty. So when you double the prices, people are like, eh, whatever. I mean, how telling was it when we talked to Scott, who has a personal training studio here in, in San Jose, Red Dot Fitness, right? High service, high dollar. We asked him, how many members have you lost? Six. Mm -hmm. yeah. Six total members. And that's yeah. because he built that loyalty because of the high yeah, service. Bought in. Totally. Exactly. So it'll, it'll be, uh, I don't know. It'll be really, really... Here, look. The regulators are the ones I'm worried about because they pass yeah. broad laws yeah. and they say, and it's just with one you know, swipe of the pen and they destroy a lot of businesses. What I wish they did is they gave recommendations and they left it to the consumer to go in and decide for themselves, does this feel safe? Does it not feel safe? It's still going to get hurt, but the regulations are we're going to screw people. I'll give you an example of what I mean. So they obviously passed this huge, you know, relief, what they'll call relief stimulus bill, right? So money to people and we need to help people. And anytime you see politicians on both sides of the aisle totally agree on something, you know you're about to get something that's going to screw a lot of people. <laughs> and that's what happened. So they passed a lot of stuff. You want to know what's happening right now? Small businesses are in a very strange conundrum because their employees, some of these small businesses are able to maintain their businesses and pay their employees, but their employees are begging to be laid off because their unemployment is more than they're getting paid. And so now the employer, and this is actually a big problem right now, a lot of these employers are in a weird situation. Do I lay them off so that they can make more money, you know, because I care about them, but then they're not working for me and I can't maintain what little business I have. Mm -hmm. And that's because of these big wide, you know, these, these wide regulations where they don't nest, you know, again, for a lot of people, they're going to be detrimental. Now, you know? are you guys still seeing people like hoard toilet paper and do crazy stuff where you guys are at? Oh my oh. God. I, there's this, this guy, right? We call him the, the toilet paper King of our uh, neighborhood, <laughs> right? We were on a walk and, and we've been doing this a lot. Uh, like the, our entire, uh, community, like we're walking around all these different houses, these different streets. And we go, we go by this guy's house and he has the balls to have his, uh, garage door all the way open. So you can like, I mean, it's very visible. You see like the stockpile, uh, right in your face there was like 10 uh 10 if not 12 of the costco size like amounts of toilet paper just stacked in the corner right there as we're walking by and it's like and it's funny because like my kids have no filter you know and so like they see something like hey why'd you buy all the toilet paper like they're like yelling at the guy and i'm like hey <laughs> calm down <laughs> like Good. like obviously this guy is uh, uh worried you know that uh, he's not gonna be able to shit comfortably shame shame him yeah you know, that's, no, that's what i'm saying yeah, they were shaming him the whole time. But yeah, it's just funny. It's like, it's like, dude, okay, first of all, you're going to go in there. You're going to take all all the toilet paper, but now you're going to show it off like, you know, like, hey, like this is my status. Instead, like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, it was the garage was rolled up and there was like a Ferrari. You exactly. Know? Now it's like, oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah he's, he's just got, flaunting it. He's, like, he's, you got know, ten, he's all flossy. 10 pallets of, uh, of I wonder how paper. much that throws off like the companies that produce it. Like, because there's not. You're yeah. right. They're, they might be getting so much demand from idiots like him. Right, because there's That's not what it was. It's there's not false. really yeah. It's, a, it's kind of a false signal, right? All of a sudden, they're they're having to produce so much more. But then then what happens when this all slows down? And everybody's they're like yeah. super. It low. wasn't even yeah. scarce. It's just that people assholes like that just start doing that. There was some guy that tried to return something like ten of those big you know packs to Costco. Tried to return them, and they told him to fuck off. 
Oh, uh, really? Yeah, because he's tre- cause they, again, he was being a jerk. They tried to return it. I read this in, a, in an article, and, no they, and the employees were super pissed. Like, oh, now you want your money back? You keep all that fucking toilet paper that you bought. <laughs> That's all you're, yours. You're stuck with it. That's all <laughs> yours now. You know what I mean? I was, I was thinking about that with because I have a garage with some like gym equipment, and I was thinking, like, I wonder if this is now something I got to be careful if somebody will want to steal. You know, because the value of certain things has changed so much. You oh, know yeah, what I'm saying? Somebody sure. was actually selling in our in our not our our forum wasn't doing this, but they posted this because they thought it was ridiculous. Somebody posted a gym setup, squat rack, bench, barbell, dumbbells, eight thousand dollars. It was what? on it was on like a Craigslist site or something. And they're like this 8, guy. 000, they're wow. like this guy wins for the <laughs> <laughs> for the biggest balls. Yeah. I wonder if he would get. I bet he gets it. I don't know, man. And, uh, There's definitely got to be some people that have lots of money, and the eight thousand dollars ain't a big deal to them. That wants that doesn't have gym access. And I would assume. My well, co- I know when it's cheap. There's a lot of flipping going on with equipment right now. That's another way to hustle. Dude, my some money. Co- my cousin bought two stands, not even a squat rack. They're just the the little tor- you know stands that you could put a barbell on. Mm-hmm. So it's not even a squat rack, a barbell, and not even like a legit awesome barbell. Just your run of the mill barbell. Regular weights, they're not the greatest, they're iron or whatever, not a ton. Two adjustable dumbbells. That's all she bought. Yeah. Thousand bucks. Wow. Thousand bucks. And and that was new. It wasn't even used. That yeah. wasn't even on the second market. Pricey. Wow. And that's because the demand has gone, you know, through the roof or whatever. Wow. Yeah. Anyway. Wow. Speaking of prices and stuff, uh, I get message. I want to make I want to say this on the podcast because I get messages all the time about the Felix Gray. Blue blocker glasses and how they never it's their birthday. Do you go know on that? sale. Yeah, it's their birthday. That's what I was gonna say. Fifteen percent off today. Yeah, all right. Their stuff never goes on sale. I know. They're such high quality, but right now uh, it's fifteen percent off because uh, of the big sale that's going on uh, for the birthday. I just had an interview that I did about this. These like uh, these guys are like um, interviewing, or they're they're the network they're trying to build is around high performing executives, and they were asking about. Uh, my thoughts on like high performance supplements and things like nootropics, stuff like that. And I said, you know, what's funny is that there's so much marketing and stuff that's behind things like that, that uh, a lot of that BS has been has been sold on a lot of these people for a very long time. And I said, you know, the irony of that is we we have we all have routines. We all have this morning routine where we you know get up, we brush our teeth, you have breakfast, you read your Wall Street Journal, whatever poop. it is, and you poop, whatever, start yep. your day. I said, how many people, including high-performing executives, do you know that have a legitimate, like, get-ready-for-bed routine? Mm-hmm. Mm. I don't know any. In fact, most of the people that I trained or that dealt yeah, with that are, are high-performing executives are the ones most guilty of still on their phone or their laptop in bed and doing things like that. And I was explaining to them, you know, instead of getting that person on you know, supplements, they would be far better and in spending two, three hundred dollars on supplements every single month, they'd be far better in investing in something that helps them with their their night routine and get it together. And I was mm-hmm. explaining some of the things that I do personally that have been game changer. And one of the things I brought up is, you know, I said I would never do done this in the past and I thought they were dorky before, but blue blocker glasses. And it's not just doing the glasses, it's also it's just making a routine yeah. that hey, when the sun goes down, I put my glasses on. I also try and bring down all the light fluorescent lights in my house and just doing that is far more beneficial than spending hundreds of dollars on performance supplements every single month it's backed yeah. by it's backed by many many studies too they yeah. show melatonin production goes up deep sleep improves um, but it, i mean it makes perfect sense your brain and your body evolved in an environment where the sun set and then went you know went down so it went from bright light to darker, 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 and then dark. Mm -hmm. And your brain actually adjusts accordingly. So when you're on your electronics or you're under bright lights Mm -hmm. and then you just hit the pillow and close your eyes. Artificial light all day long. Yeah, and then you close your eyes and you expect yourself to get this great sleep. It takes like an hour or two for your brain and body to even register that it's time to go to sleep. I was uh, talking to my brother-in-law about uh, a lot of these these corporations like Apple, Google, Facebook, and just about their work environment. And like, I'm like, oh my God, like, how's this all going to change? Or, or, or a lot of the employees going to stay at home now because of all this stuff that's that's going on. And, and they found that they're productive, but he said that they're productive, but they're not productive in a cohesive way where normally they, they're, they're in like the workspace. So that way they can directly communicate with each other so they can keep the, the projects moving that they're individual working on. So to be able to kind of piece it all together, they still need to be in close proximity. So he's saying that they're actually going to be coming back in uh, a lot more to 
to the workspace, but they're having them spread out. And also there's all these like new parameters where they're going to have like ionized filtration systems and UV uh, filtration system to, to kill the, the diseases and, and bacteria uh, uh, within that. And I was like, oh, my God, all that. And then also, you know, I'm like, dude. I, I tried to tell them about blue blockers and like how that should be like a standard for, for employees as they come back and they're, they're on there already. I'm like surprised they haven't like instituted that yet. Oh, that's happening. You know, it's funny though. You say that is that uh, Facebook is actually the opposite. They're looking to actually uh, get rid of some of their, their um, locations mm -hmm. because they're having so much success with everybody working mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a, See, I have that's a, what I thought, but he said the opposite. Uh, yeah. I have yeah. a niece and she's at, she works for Facebook and she's her, her hub is in New York. And they're actually talking about just keeping them all home till the rest of the year. Mm, Doesn't yeah. matter what, what what they legislate or anything like that. Just like they're having so much success with everybody working remotely anyways. Mm -hmm. And they're like, why risk it? And then what they might do is actually downsize some of their facilities. It's pretty interesting what you've seen with things like that. I think in many ways, life will never be the same again. And I don't mean that in a bad way. In fact, I think what we're going to find is certain industries are going to realize that they could do business in a more efficient, effective way. One of them is what you just said, Adam. A lot of companies are starting to realize that, hey, you know what? A large segment of our workforce can work from home. We're more productive. It saves us money. They prefer it because they like to be at home. Now, that's going to change some interesting behaviors. Are people going to move further away from work hubs, not worrying about a uh, long commute. Right. How is that going to change the work-life balance? That'll be interesting. But I do think that there'll be some permanent changes there. I think education is going to change also permanently. I see a lot of colleges are staying closed uh, to the fall and are only offering online courses. When you're doing everything online, why would you spend $100,000 on your, your private college tuition when it's all just coming online anyway? Yeah. And why would I spend so much money on a book when I'm downloading it this way anyway, I think it'll open the door for less expensive, efficient, you know, s sources of education. I really do. Oh, totally. So I think that's going to change permanently. And then the, the, the home delivery with food, I think you're, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think it'll be maybe as much as it is now, but it'll be more than it would have been had this whole oh, situation. It'll increase it substantially. Yeah. Speaking of food, um, I finally got a grip on the, the processed food consumption. It's so hard when you're stuck at home and you don't want to go grocery shopping uh -huh. and you have, you know, you buy all this stuff. The paleo meat sticks are game changer. Like yeah. just having them in the house makes it totally better than buying than, than grabbing something else and it's i like it because especially you know even on the kid level like just having things available around for snacks and stuff that aren't like you know like chips and like all the regular kind of stuff, like those bars and all z bars and all this kind of stuff like having those around like i just feel better about them eating did those. you guys either one of you guys look up because i know on on the actual um you know beef stick it doesn't actually have the macro breakdown did you guys figure out i know it's like 70 calories a stick but what's the protein intake on it it's Six, six grams per stick. Uh, I think it's how many grams of fat? Is it like two grams of fat? Two grams oh, of fat. Wow. Of I believe no okay. no carbs or whatever. Um, it's naturally fermented. You know how interesting that is. So they don't use uh, GMO corn. I think it's called citric acid. I can't remember what it was to ferment it. It's a natural fermented process, which means their beef sticks actually have uh, healthy probiotics. Actually, oh, nice. five grams of fat. Five grams of fat. Sorry. Okay. So they actually have healthy probiotics in them. So what you may find is, you know, that these meat sticks are feel better on your gut than other types of, you know, oh, that's yeah, interesting. long shelf life type of meat or whatever. That's right. really good though. Only 70 calories a stick. That's not bad at all. No. And still getting six grams of protein. You have three of those. It's not a big deal at all. The 200 something calories and then getting like 20 grams of protein. That's yeah. nice. And they taste good, but it's not like the kind of uh, where you eat and then you start to mindlessly eat. You know what I mean? You end up eating 500 calories of Lace potato chips like I did. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you get somewhat satiated that way at yeah. least. Dude, so um, politics. I know Doug loves it when I bring up politics. <laughs> but I'm not going to – this This is not that controversial. Squeezing it in here. This huh? is not that controversial, Doug. Um, I, I – you know, I've commented on how I think it's going to be very difficult. And I don't have a horse in this race. But I don't, I think, I don't think – I think it's going to be difficult to beat Trump with what the, the Democrats had on their side or whatever. I did not consider the following strategy, which I think is the smartest. If they can make this happen, this is the smartest uh, political strategy that the Democrats could bring. And I think it would pose as a th hardcore threat What's that? against Trump. Biden having Michelle Obama as his vice president. Now, I, is that true? I heard rumors of that, yeah. and I haven't seen anything confirmed on that. It has not been confirmed, but Biden said he would love it. 
they wouldn't announce it until the perfect moment. So even mm. if they did agree, one thing that they tend to do is they Wait, say, "Was it we're is thinking it, about it?" I thought that he, I thought, um, or was it Bernie Sanders that uh, Obama didn't co-sign for? Did he co-sign for Biden? Did well, he, Biden was his VP. Yeah. Okay, so he obviously, I'm he, pretty sure he co-signed. Yeah. yeah. So, but uh, Biden with um, so with Michelle Obama, that would be such a hard ticket to beat because yeah, she's a powerful force. She's super loved. Yeah. Her as the VP means her husband is now kind of in the White House, and people loved the Obama Biden administration, which it would still be Obama Biden or Biden Obama <laughs> administration. Yeah. Right. And as much as Biden, you know, you know, bumbles and whatever, Michelle is very tight. Yeah, she can articulate points a lot better for sure. The I mean, only, yeah, the only person who does better on the stage is her is is her husband. The only thing they'd come at her with is her experience, right? With being a politician. That's why she'd be as a VP. It's it's it would be perfect. Yeah. Politi- from the political strategist in me is like, oh my gosh, that would be now. At what point? The will, best. Well, at what point do we have to hear that? Like, when will this be announced? If it is going to happen, I don't know when they announce the VP picks. But what one thing that they tend to do is they say things like, "We would love for this to happen," or "Oh yeah, that might be a good idea," and then test mm-hmm. to see what the response is to help them make their decision. So, but we're not going to find well, out. That's so. kind of a wild card, huh? I do see that actually is is being interesting. Oh, it would be very interesting, and I think if that happened, then it would be a fifty fifty shot. I think we'd see the 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 election cycle of the yeah. Of the, may, of may turn you, the know, you say that about Trump, but I mean, with what, what worries me for him, and again, I'm like you. I don't have I don't have a dog in this fight. But what what about unemployment right now? Isn't unemployment just like crazy through the roof right now? Yeah, yeah. but but that's the thing. It's it's going to be blamed on the on the virus. Yeah, does it's that not matter? Be blamed on, yes, I, it does. Really? It does. As long as he looks statistically like, statistically speaking, that's not true. Because anytime it, you've had, it doesn't matter what the reason is or is not. If unemployment is at record highs, that person never gets reelected. If it if it, it does matter, the reason matters big time. If you if they if the reason of the unemployment is blamed on the person in office, it, it kills them. If it's blamed on something outside of their control, and that person looks like they led with confidence during that, then they'll be trusted and they'll be voted See, for. See, I thought that's untrue. I thought any time that we've had the uh, the high, highest numbers in unemployment, always the president's not, no matter what it is, hasn't been reelected. Well, again, name one time where we had something completely not due to anything that has to do with economics cause unemployment. I, I, can't, I can't think of any time, right? Whether it was the Great Depression or the Great Recession, that could very easily get put and blamed on legislators and politicians. Coronavirus is a virus. Now, if Trump's approach to the coronavirus gets painted as a terrible one. Which has been. Well, they try. That's yeah. the thing. But that that's a tough one. It's that's murky. A, yeah. That's a really, really it's tough a one. Real, yeah. yeah, I'm Clear. telling you, their, their best bet, man, if they get Michelle as uh, Biden's running mate, that'll be their best bet by far. Otherwise, I don't see them coming close. Hmm. Okay, first question is from Haley Phillips, 34. If my left bicep and shoulder are bigger than my right right bicep and shoulder, does that mean I should do extra reps on the smaller, less developed arm? So there's two strategies when trying to bring up symmetry, okay? One is, in my experience, far better than the other. Now, one is to maintain your current level of training and everything for the more developed side and just try to make the underdeveloped side develop faster, even faster than it has been. The other strategy is to use the smaller side and weaker side as a guide. So you slow down the development from the dominant side to allow the smaller side to catch up. Now, the first option sounds more uh, appealing to people because they don't want to slow any gains down, right? So they no, no, no. I want to keep everything growing at the same pace. I just want to make the weaker, smaller side grow faster. But the truth is that almost never works. I've almost never seen that balance someone out. The only strategy I've ever, ever really seen be effective is where you slow down the progress from the bigger side by using the smaller side as a guide. So one way to do that would be, let's say one shoulder is stronger than the other. I do my sets with my weaker side first and however many reps I could do with that, I do that with the, with the stronger side, even if I can do more, even if I could do more with the stronger side. I I agree Mm -hmm. with that, but there's part of this, there's, there's a question that's missing from this question and that's why. Right. So and I think that's the mistake that a lot of people make in this situation. There's a there's normally a really good reason why there's that much discrepancy. 
So, and this was a mistake that I think I made as a young trainer early on was just trying to solve the, oh, this is bigger. So, and what Sal said, I think is, is the answer. I think that going unilateral type of movements, focus on the weaker side first, as soon as your form starts to break down, you stop it right there. And then you mirror that with the dominant side, even if you can do two or three more sets and eventually it'll catch up. But there normally is a reason why you have have that and this one in particular like when you have the the shoulder and the bicep dominant i had this and i can't help but think that this person what is that's their dominant side is that way and it's rolled forward right so if you have like i had where my my left shoulder was rolled forward just and it's like just barely the average eye wouldn't be able to tell this but it was just enough rolled forward more than the other side so then every time that i did these curls my 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 front delt and my bicep was or my front delt was taking over the load and then it's already a dominant strong side because it's my dominant side that I use to play sports and everything else and so and then you go to do you know barbell exercises where both arms are working at the same time and the dominant side just takes over the movement you got to address the 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 breakdown in the mechanics and the posture right so and that's that was really uh, the motivation behind Maps Prime is you have that assessment test that's in there to see how your your mechanics are and how you how your movement is and then if you're it's broken down anywhere what exercises you should do to prime and address that and so to me you also need to do whatever is necessary before the workout to fix your posture and a, and a good video to reference is the the bicep curl one that I did on our YouTube channel. And this is part of the reason why I talked about the pulling the shoulders back and doing this split stance thing is because it is, it's very common with people that are learning to, and this is not talking about advanced people, everybody else, general population, when they do a bicep curl with both arms, like doing a camber curl or a straight bar curl, they end up cheating one side more than the other. And so addressing the breakdown in the form and technique and using something like a, the the Prime or the Prime Pro compasses and tests in there, that, in my opinion, has to be done first before any of this, and then you take the advice that you just gave Sal and go that way. Yeah, I think it's interesting to think about. Uh, I definitely agree with with you, you know focusing on um, you know bringing it up, but also like doing as many reps as you can, and then kind of stopping with your dominant arm, but. What about, you know, the lifestyle implications in terms of like then prioritizing certain movements that aren't super skilled movements, but they're just everyday things that you're constantly focused on, like using more of your left arm, like just picking things up constantly, uh, opening things, like grabbing things, just doing, just being a lot more mindful of like using your, your left arm to then kind of like reconnect and, and get that a portion of it because you know a lot of it is just a loss of connection a loss of function uh that uh, may prohibit you from uh you know using it within uh a, a workout no i think that's good advice but the truth is nobody fucking does nobody's that. gonna do yeah. it but it'd be yeah. interesting if they did like an oh, experiment it is it's it's good advice it's good advice because if you were to do that i think that in itself would already help and make a difference the reality of it is nobody's gonna do that sure mm -hmm. nobody's gonna start brushing their teeth with the opposite hand eating with the opposite hand combing their hair with the opposite hand, yeah. you know, picking groceries up with the, the the less dominant. Unfortunately, we just, we're not that aware. You know, we're not, we're, we're, we have so many other things that we need to be more aware of before we even get to that level where we're being that aware of what we're doing. So to me, more unilateral work is yeah. is in hand, but addressing it, this is why the those programs were designed was to help people try and troubleshoot and figure out why am I not moving properly? Why is one side developing more than the other? There's a root cause of this. Mm -hmm. I'm, we're mm -hmm. speculating right now because we're on a podcast and I can't see the person, but if they were in front of me, that would be my job as a coach is to figure out why is there an imbalance here? Where is the breakdown and the communication in their body? And then help them address that. Well, and it also highlights like how much do you want it to change, right? So if you're not willing to do that, like uh, for me, like I broke my arm twice the same year, my right arm, I had to learn everything with my left arm. And that's something that like totally transformed like the way that I do things, uh, you know, in terms of like being able to activate and like, like actively use both arms. Like I just do that all the time now. Yeah, one of the most uh, imbalanced, you know, from right to left. Because everybody, most people are going to have a little bit of a discrepancy uh, between the right and left side. But man, one, I trained one kid who uh, was a pitcher for his, most of his life in baseball. Like as a kid, 
growing up. And this kid was just, and he could throw heat. I mean, in high school, he was hitting almost 90 miles an hour. I mean, just incredible. Um, but when I trained him, his body was morphed and twisted into this pitcher. His right arm was way more developed. His his you know strength in his right it was like two it was like you took two separate people and cut them in half and then glued them together and that was all because of what Justin's talking about just using one side over and over and over again it's pretty crazy. Next question is from Donovan Kirkpatrick. Do I have to hit abs directly for every full body workout or can I rely on compound lifts like deadlifts and squats to work the core? And just work out my abs directly once a week. Well, you're an adult. You can do whatever you want. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> when people ask, can I please? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can. Literally, you can do whatever you want. But yeah. you know, okay, look. I know that's funny. Here's the thing with uh, with deadlifts and squats. This is where the confusion comes from when people are like, it works your core, and then they have studies that show that when you squat and deadlift, that there's all this you know muscle activation in the core. Okay, that's true. Your core is very active. When you're doing a heavy exercise that's standing because your core has to stabilize your body. But there's also uh, specificity in how muscles uh, activate and work and how their strength is expressed. Okay, So if your core gets really, really good at stabilizing you for deadlifts and squats, that's probably going to come from deadlifts and squats. But your core might not be strong moving through full ranges of motion like a full sit-up right. or a crunch. It's totally different. Now, there's some carryover, so you'll be better than somebody who does nothing at all, but you're not developing the muscle through. You're just highlighting one function. Isometrics. Yeah. Yep, yep. That's it. It's just like, it, imagine if you only did isometrics for your biceps right, or right. only did isometrics for your chest. Like, What's great and, and why there's studies and, and why people, why this is even a conversation is because there is a lot to support. There's a lot of value in that. That's one one of the great benefits of heavy deadlifting and heavy squatting is it's incredible for isometrics for your abs mm -hmm. to stabilize your core with two, three, four hundred pounds on your back takes a lot of isolation strength. But there's uh, there's two other parts there. There's the concentric and eccentric portion of the exercise that's completely being neglected. So it'd be like only doing isometrics for all the other parts of your body and and neglecting the eccentric and concentric portion of every other exercise. Yeah. It's yeah. not that it's it's bad. It's not that it doesn't get some work. Your abs are getting some work, and it's I tell you what, it's better than nothing. Mm -hmm. The guy who you're the guy or girl who squats heavy and deadlifts heavy is better off than someone who does no exercise for their abs, right? So that person is better off than that. But you are missing out on two other parts that are extremely beneficial. Yeah, this myth, or I don't want to say myth, but this idea really came from the, the power lifter segment of the, the lifting community. Because they didn't want to do it. They don't want to do it. Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> Typically, they don't have abs anyway, or they're not supposed to have abs. You know, when you're a power lifter, you're not getting judged on how you look. It's about how much weight you can lift. So a lot of them don't give a shit about, you know, looking really great in the midsection. It's like, how much can I lift? So then it became... Well, why do I need to work my abs anyway? Like, who cares? I'm just, you know, I'm squatting. I'm just stabilizing. I'm good at it. It's all good. Why work my abs to begin with? You still, you also hear power to say things like, why do I need to work my calves? Uh, why do I need to work biceps? Sometimes you'll hear mm -hmm. strength athletes say, you know, if you train muscles fully, it's better than you if you don't. That's all. So it's a little bit, it's going to be better if you train it right. fully than if you don't. But uh, is it, are you going to be okay if you only hit your abs? You know, you know, once a week, yeah, you'll probably be fine. It's not a big deal. They're just not going to be as developed, or you're not going to have as, 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 you know, full development of the strength curve and all the strength, you know, factors with your abs. Mm -hmm. Just not going to be as good. That's all. Next question is from the Grumpy Yeti. The front squat is now often regarded as more functional than the back squat. It doesn't allow for as great of overload, but it allows for a greater range of motion and is more quad focused and core and upper back demanding plus if you deadlift the hamstring and glute emphasis is already there should the front squat take the pedestal from the back squat I, I, you know mm. no nope. no i don't think so i mean could it for someone i guess sure but i don't think so this the idea that oh this exercise works those muscles therefore we don't need to do this other exercise i can see the rationale there but again, when you build strength, there's a lot of specificity to how that strength is applied. So if I deadlift a lot, yeah, I'm working my glutes and hamstrings quite a bit. Am I developing squat strength by doing that? You're developing some squat strength, 
but not a lot of back squat strength. Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I would argue that we're already very much uh, anterior, anterior. Uh, driven. Like it, it, there's like in excess, like everything is anterior driven, and so the opportunity to present more exercises that address the posterior chain are invaluable because we just don't. We we don't focus on that, and a mm. back squat is essential for that. Uh, yes, the, the the deadlift covers that as well. You want more exercises to specifically cover, uh, you, you know that that portion. You, you need that support system to be in balance, so that way you're not overly dominant with your with your quads. Which most clients I've had, especially athletes, are quad dominant. Well, this is just another thing that highlights why I, I get annoyed by our space so much too. It's like. The truth is they both belong there and there's, and there's nothing wrong with maybe for a while you're focused heavily on the front front squat and there is no back squats. You know, there's many times in my training where I go months and I don't back squat because I'm focusing on my front squat for a while, or I'm doing something or I'm lunging, doing unilateral. What Sal just came off of this recently, mm -hmm. I believe, right? You eliminated I didn't back. squat for, for almost three months. Right. So mm -hmm. there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But when, when, camps try and make cases for this is more functional and this is better and there's no need to do this or it's like the yeah. the truth is why would you not do both they they both have tremendous benefits um and you can probably have one in each camp argue why one's more the truth is have them both like why why subject yourself to saying that oh i'm only going to do this or it should take the front stage opposed to another yeah. movement it's like no they're both i mean if you look at our programming there's always front squats and back squats incorporated because that we see the tremendous value in both of them and mm -hmm. justin's right i think we are extremely anterior driven but this person's very right too you get deeper in the squat you have to have better shoulder mobility to do it so there are some great benefits to becoming a good front oh, it's a great exercise right but yeah. uh, like to your point we don't do enough posterior chain work. So, mm -hmm. you know, why why not have both included in there because they both are so functional and yeah, so great. Now, now the, the whole functional argument sometimes annoys the shit out of me too because people become very narrow with their focus. So front squat, maybe it's more functional from this standpoint. If you're likely to squat with weight in the real world, it's probably going to be something you're holding in front of you. Yes, a lot of people can go lower in a front squat. In fact, I would more often than not be able to get a everyday client to be able to do a good front squat before I could get them to do a back squat. So oftentimes when I'm training someone and we're in the beginning stages of training, they're front squatting way more uh, than they're more often than they're back squatting. Just to just your your form is it's easier to get somebody in a, in a better position. Okay. That being said, there's also this the the amount of strength that you gain sometimes washes out some of these factors. So. If I take a back squat, I can squat more with the back squat than I can with the front squat. And my gains in the back squat, once I do it right, tend to go up really fast, faster than a front squat, a little bit faster than a front squat. So if I'm able to squat back squat 400 pounds, but only able to front squat 250 pounds, the front squat might edge it in functionality in terms of movement, because, but because of the overall strength gains I get from the back squat, it still wins. Now, I'm not saying... I'm not making the argument that one is better than the other. It really depends on the individual. But my argument is you got to look at the whole thing. You can't just look at, oh, the function. Because then you get into the craziness. Like, well, you know, we should do everything split stance since we walk that way. Right. Let's do everything on well, one leg. Well, that's the truth, though. If you're going to make the functional argument, then I would argue back to yeah. you that, well, okay, well, a goblet, split squats. a goblet squat or a walking lunge is more functional. Right. Because, or, or even a zerger squat is more functional. Because or when are you ever going to rack something on the front of your shoulders with mm -hmm. your elbows? Present? I don't ever carry anything like that. I carry it more like a zerger squat or like mm -hmm. a goblet squat if I carry something. So, yeah, yeah the, the default to the this is more functional functional than that. The, all that does is it, it appeases all of us nerds that are really into fitness and it loses all the general population that really need the good advice. And the fucking advice for 99% of the population, you need both in your life. Next question is from Noah Wilmot 97. What were the hardest obstacles for you to overcome during your fitness journey? Ooh. Hardest obstacle. Ooh. Mine, yeah. mine is what we, I just, I mean, not just, it's been a while now the the back to back of the low testosterone so coming off of testosterone after being on uh higher doses like when i was competing right so <clears throat> coming off of that to none and obviously i worked my way down but once i got to a place where i was taking none um that coupled 
with tearing my Achilles right after that. Double wing. Oh man, it was it was already hard, right? And I knew it was going to be hard. I knew it was going to be difficult. Uh, I knew I was going to have low testosterone levels. I knew I I was going to lose my strength. I was going to lose lots of muscle. I was going to lose the drive to even get to the gym. And so I was already thinking about that, going, okay, Adam, you just need to stay active. Think of the things that you love to do, like basketball, integrate that into your fitness so that it keeps you consistent with working out and exercise. And then you'll get back to feeling stronger as your hormone levels come up. And then sure as shit, I'm like two weeks into playing basketball and I tear my Achilles. So now I'm dealing with hormone level, uh, uh, testosterone levels being extremely low. And then on top of that, having a torn Achilles, that had to have been the worst storm that I ever had to weather. I mean, that's the closest I've probably been to depression since probably mm. back in my house days, maybe like 2012 or whatever that was. Yeah. There's no, there's no doubt that if you're really into working out and fitness, making the transition from, I love this because I'm getting strong. I love this because I'm you know, able to lift more weight. I look better. I'm chiseled. You know, this is great. Like that to, if you work out long enough at some point, you're going to encounter something like what Adam did or what I did where at one point uh, I had severe digestive issues, thought I had an auto, autoimmune disease. I, it turns out I didn't, but I thought I did. And you have to make the transition from training for strength, training for aesthetics to I exercise now is just to maintain my health. That is a hard, mm -hmm. that is a very hard transition that all of you listening are going to have to go through if you stay consistent long enough. You stay consistent with your fitness long enough. If you're young right now, you're probably, you know, motivated. You just love, you're, you're getting stronger, you're faster. I feel good. Everything works good. This is great. And at some point, whether it's uh, a family issue, a job issue, health issue, injury, something is going to, you know, there's going to be a wrench that's going to be thrown into that machinery and you're going to have to develop a brand new relationship with exercise or stop altogether. Mm -hmm. Some people never go back. Some people get injured, get off testosterone like Adam did. And I know guys like this, they were all juiced up in their twenties, had to go off and just stop lifting weights because they just, their, their relationship with exercise was purely to build muscle and look amazing. And once they had no testosterone, well, you ain't going to train the same. You ain't going to get the same benefits and results. So they're just like, screw it. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, that's a very hard obstacle. I had to do it myself. I, I had to completely shift from training for aesthetics and performance to training for health. It was extremely difficult. I, I was almost forced to make that transition. It took me a year to really start to develop that relationship. But at the other end, um, I had a, I have a much more complete lifelong relationship with exercise. But it's a hard. that's a hard transition. Yeah, for me, it was more... Um, that transition from being a uh, working out to then produce a better version of myself to perform on the field and, and see you know what all my work transpired to become and and also along with that you're working out with people uh, all the time next to you and so I was like working in a team environment I would work out I was like the typical guy that would work out with like a workout partner mm. you know and like we would plan and organize our workouts like based off each other's schedules and uh you know and then once once the the last game i played like i i went through this whole cycle of depression of just like i you know well what what am i even gonna work out for you know like what, what am i doing this for like i just didn't have a clear vision of what that looked like anymore it was like it was always uh for something and so um, you know, it took me a good like year and a half, maybe even two years of just like scrambling to find a, a motivating factor for me to, uh, you know, push myself. So, and then, and then later on, as I, as I got a little more, uh, mature in the process, realized like, I don't need to, you, you know, hammer myself to produce the results that I want and to be healthy and to do all these things. Like I can actually feel really good, you know, coming out of these workouts. And so anyway, it just, it, that was a really, really tough transition for me. Cause it just wasn't clear. I didn't have a vision of what that looked like. Many times it's, we need to just change the goal, right? So, you know, we're, it's really common that when you get into working out, you're heavily focused on the way you look or, you know, losing pounds on the scale. 
you know, or big, getting bigger muscles. And so there, we, we tend to have these very superficial type of goals. It's just, it's just how we all operate. We're, we're driven by insecurities. We're uh, visual creatures. And so a lot of times that's what gets us initially motivated to come in the gym. And eventually that, that does, like Sal said, you, you will be faced with that one day. And when you do, if you're still hung up on that goal, like if I was still hung up on what, how do I still build as much muscle as I was when I was doing steroids or can I get at least close to that or I still want to look awesome, you know, if I was so hung up on that goal during that time, I, I definitely would have fell into depression and never came back to, to working out. But I just had to, I had to reframe what my new goal is and, you know, the give the the spiritual side of me right so i know anybody who's who's non-spiritual this will this will bug them or whatever so we reverse or take out god and put universe for whatever reason you know crystals, crystals yeah chris yeah, yeah whatever yeah, yeah. whatever makes you feel better <laughs> but for me i always felt like right, i always go. i always mother i am. i always feel like when i i feel so strongly about something that i want uh, God always has this funny way of slapping me in the face and being like, "This isn't this isn't your plan. This is my plan." And I, I, and I'm always reminded of that when I have things like this. Like, and for me, I said that when that happened to me, testosterone wise, I shifted over. Like, okay, this is how I'm going to handle it. And then all of a sudden, I tear my Achilles. That to me is that wake up call. It's like, okay, Adam, you're you're looking in the wrong areas of your life. This isn't where you're supposed to be focused. And so, whatever you want to believe in, I think that. We get revealed things like this all the time in our life. And if you're struggling right now and you constantly keep trying to force towards a certain direction, maybe you're going the wrong direction. And maybe there's something else that you should be focusing on and reframing and changing your goal. You know what's interesting about this, right? You have three uh, guys who have made fitness their life, who's been, who've all been working out for decades, right? Relatively or extremely consistently and all of our answers there was a common theme it, although different circumstances the theme was developing a new relationship with exercise from the one i started with that was the hardest obstacle yeah it's not the injury that was the hard obstacle for adam it's not the that i got sick the hard obstacle or that that justin stopped playing sports it's that what is exercise what does fitness mean to me now and it's funny it reminds me of there's a certain type of client that is the most likely to hire a personal trainer, but also simultaneously the most likely to stop after a short period of time. That's the client that comes in and wants to get in shape for a specific date or an event. If somebody comes in to hire you and says, I want to get in shape for Vegas. I want to get in shape for my wedding. I want to get in shape for whatever. Mm -hmm. As a trainer, I knew the odds are going to hire me are very high. This is like a no, pro they're going to definitely buy some training for me. The challenge was keeping them going when they after they were done with that date because their relationship to exercise had a time frame it had a time limit on it a specific one whether it be you know March 37th you know the 27th not 37th yeah. doesn't exist March 27th <laughs> I'm getting married or whatever okay yeah. and after These March COVID days are really blending together yeah. <laughs> totally yeah. you know oh you know I, I got married on that day I'm done now my relationship to exercise either needs to change or I'm done with it right so if you want long-term success your relationship to exercise is, if you want long-term success, you're better off tying it to, uh, you know, making myself be a better person, uh, working with my health, working with my life circumstances. That exercise to me is a way to improve myself in all aspects, not just something specific like strength, because that mm -hmm. can be taken from you, or my body, hey, circumstances may change, or you know, I'm going to do these specific exercises, that's all I do because you may get injured, or it's to do great in a race because then the race ends. It's really to tie it something that's, that's bigger than that, which is general growth, general overall health. If you do that, you're much more likely to have long-term success. And with that, go to mindpumpfree.com and download all of our guides and resources. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin. You can find me at mindpumpsal and Adam at mindpumpadam.